Thank you all for coming so early in the morning. You will be glad you did. Our first speaker, uh, she uh, uh, did her PhD at University of Washington. Then she did her uh, postdoc at the Salk Institute, which has a bit of a reputation for putting out good scientists. And now she's at the University of Pennsylvania. And to be brief, which I've been asked to be, uh, she has really become, uh, in my opinion, the leader in the uh, prenatal stress effects in, in, in uh, biological systems, and uh, at least in the uh, mam mammalian systems, and um, has been looking into the mechanisms, and I would argue that she had uh, the uh, uh, the best poster I saw at the Society for Neuroscience, which is going to be part of the uh, topic today that we're going to hear about. And uh, we've actually used her, her models in our lab, and, uh, and she... Uh, Without further ado, I really don't want to delay her anymore because uh, she's going to really be able to uh, put some fantastic data out there and really show how epigenetics affects biology in the setting of prenatal stress. Tracy Bell. Okay. I want to thank the organizing committee for the invitation to attend. It's not often that as a scientist, I'm a neuroscientist, that we have the opportunity to speak and interact in such a forum where it's more of a discussion-based learning and topic-based um, examination of a topic in this way. Usually it's just a very scientific, fact-based discussion. So I'm very excited to be here. We've already um, interacted a lot with the undergraduates on campus and had some really interesting discussions last night as to these topics, so I hope that continues. So without further ado, Let's launch into the discussion. So three scientists walk into a bar, and they notice two alcoholic mice, a mother and her son, sitting on bar stools, madly lapping gin from thimbles. The mother mouse looks up and says to the three, hey, geniuses, tell me how it is that my son got into this sorry state. Do that. Bad genes, says Mendel. No, it was your helicopter parenting, says Freud. In fact, it was your ancestor's unfitness, says Darwin. As the three continue to argue, in walks a very smartly dressed woman who settles their debate. In fact, it was clearly not enough exercise or White House garden vegetables. So if you were here last night, we launched into the topic of understanding maternal programming. And I think that when we say, for most of the audience, we are here to discuss epigenetics and maternal exposures. This is what you sort of think about. You think about mom during pregnancy, the early life, the prenatal exposures, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But I also want to introduce the idea of which my talk will uh, focus on as well as the next talk from, from Ali Rando, which is in fact aspects of paternal exposure. And I think that in this conversation tends to be left out, and so we'll launch into that as well. So in order to understand epigenetics, and I want to make sure everybody in the audience is on the same page of what we're talking about here, because epigenetics, as we discussed yesterday, can take on many different definitions. I think for the most part, when we're saying epigenetics, what we really, uh, a good word to fit in there, to substitute, would be just programming in general. Epigenetics can be a very specific concept to scientists, in which we're talking about specific marks. And it started by thinking about Mendel and his little pea patch and thinking about inheritance and how the traits that you have, the color of your eyes, the color of your hair, et cetera, are inherited traits. And we know that as Gregor Mendel has spent so much time in his pea patch figuring out that this is a lot in large part determined by your DNA. But how is it that the environment intervenes here? How is it that the environment can shape traits for a best fit? Well, then you introduce Darwin and you talk about evolution. But evolution is way too slow. There's no way that you could have a dynamic process by which, if you think about obesity, for instance, where fitness for your environment could happen fast enough to influence your genes, right? That would take too long for evolution to be a factor here. So neither of these two geniuses really were able to conceive of how our current environment itself could influence how traits are rapidly inherited and how those would be best fit in a rapid way. So this sounds a little Lamarckian, doesn't it? And we had this discussion yesterday, what that topic means as well. But was Lamarck really that far off? If you have, in this instance here, where Lamarck is suggesting that a trait that benefits mom while she's pregnant could be passed on directly by some magical way to the offspring for best fit, so that introduces this idea of how does, in fact, the environment interact with your DNA, your inherit from your mom and your dad, your backbone of your DNA, but how is it that the environment influences as was stated earlier, the expression of the genes, whether or not you have different SNPs, 
right? So that's one thing with, that in, in sequencing of the human genome, we thought that this would solve so many diseases, and it really hasn't. And in large part, that is because your DNA is sort of your background. That's a starting point. But the environment then influences how those patterns of genes can be expressed. They can be turned on, turned off, up or down. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So what are we talking about in a simpler way about genetics, epigenetics? So if you take your DNA, which is tightly wound, right? You look down at your chromosome level. We're actually looking for very specific marks, histone modifications around nucleosomes, methylation of the DNA, and we'll talk a lot about small non-coding microRNAs. Really, when we're talking about marks of epigenetics, that's what we're talking about. So we're not changing the DNA sequence that you've inherited, that's unlikely to change, unless we're talking about specific mutations. That's not what we're talking about today. So the epigenetic marks we're talking about are on top of your DNA. That's what epigenetics means. So it can be modifications of a histone, which is required for transcription, methylation of DNA in specific sites, and we're going to talk a lot about these small non-coding microRNAs, and I'll explain those in a minute. So my lab is interested in understanding the epigenetics because my lab is particularly interested in neuropsychiatric disease. I'm a neuroscientist. Neuropsychiatric and especially neurodevelopmental disorders are very complex, and you'll hear a lot about some of those today. Why is it that we don't really understand all of the factors that contribute? We, why can't we say who and who won't, uh, who is at risk for a particular disease, or who will present with it? So we think about maternal exposures, and I think to start with that is the easiest conceptually to think about. Mom is pregnant. The baby is gestating. That which she experiences, and that could be both negative and positive, and I want to stop for a second and highlight that because the conversation last night I think got a little bit toward the negative side in terms of negative experiences. Why do we think about that as scientists? Because we are funded by the National Institute of Health. The National Institute of Health is interested in what underlies neurodevelopmental or neuropsychiatric disease, of course. All of my funding comes from the National Institute of Mental Health. So it's not that we think only in terms of negative, it's just that we're interested in, under, in understanding or defining the risk factors for those diseases. That does not mean, and I really want to emphasize that, that only negative experiences can cause changes, right? Obviously, positive experiences as well. And so I put this in here last night thinking about what are the positive experiences, and we did touch on that last night a little bit. So all that you do, everything that happens during pregnancy, certainly can have an influence and an impact, positive or negative, on the outcome of the offspring. And many of the, the animal models, and the reason that we use animal models, my lab uses mice, is because in order to understand the mechanism, we have to model it in an animal such that we can go into, look at the developing brain, look at the developing placenta, and ask specific questions of what we can't do in a human. So those can be things like maternal uh, infection. We know that that's highly associated with neurodevelopmental disease risk, maternal depression, and maternal obesity. And these are many factors that scientists around the world study, and we model these in rodents and other animals to understand the contributing factors. When the exposure happened, first, second, or third trimester. Right? So we can model that in a rodent. We can look early, mid, or late gestation and ask when the insult happened, what the insult was, and the degree to which the insult was, how does that contribute to changes within the brain? So in order to understand much of what I'm going to describe today, for, I want to make sure everyone's on the same page when I talk about stress. My lab is particularly interested in stress. So first, let me put out there that stress itself is not evil. Stress itself is not disease, and I want to make sure that that's really clear. Stress is your brain's ability to perceive a change in the environment and appropriately respond. And for most people sitting here in this room, you will have, you will be on sort of the, if you think about a, a curve, you'll be somewhere at the top of normal of how you respond. What we're really interested in is trying to figure out how do we model and how do we understand the development of the brain in which you are too responsive to stress, you respond to everything in too high of a way, or you're not enough responsive to stress. And that's important because evolution has it that all mammals respond to stress because that is the most important physiological response to maintain homeostasis, to survive in an environment. You need to perceive the stress and you need to respond to it. So it's, stress does not cause disease. Okay, let's just put that out there. Stress does not cause disease. Stress can be an underlying factor contributing to disease uh, onset, disease predisposition, or changes during development that may make you at higher risk for disease. So I want to make sure first we all understand what I'm talking about with stress. This is showing you an axis diagram of the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. So if I say HPA, that's what I mean. 
This axis is the same in all mammals. And that's great because when we try to understand neuropsychiatric disease in a mouse, you can imagine that that's really complicated. But because we know that stress can be an underlying factor, we know that those individuals who are hyper-responsive or hypo-responsive to stress can be at higher risk for presentation of disease and is a contributing factor certainly to neurodevelopmental disease risk. So it's great to have this axis that we can study in a mammal, in any mammal, mice included, that is the same. All the players are the same in a mouse as they are in a human. So here you have the brain, and again, this could be a mouse or a human. There's a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. Within the hypothalamus, there's this tiny little region here, which is in purple, called the paraventricular nucleus, the PVN. And this is where these neurons are that express CRF, corticotropin releasing factor. All you need to remember is that is upon stress, so if there was suddenly an alarm that was to go off in this room and everybody would respond, and again, to a different degree, depending on who you are, those neurons will be activated. And they will immediately dump CRF and they will activate in the pituitary then specific receptors, and in the pituitary then will release another hormone into the circulation called ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. That ACTH will travel in your circulation very quickly, and it will act at the adrenal gland. Your adrenals sit right above your kidneys. They are teeny tiny, but they're hugely important for maintaining homeostasis. ACTH will act on those uh, receptors in the adrenal gland, and then the adrenals will go to work, and they will kick out a lot of hormones, predominantly glucocorticoids. Those are your stress hormones. What's beautiful about that is that in you or in a mouse, I can take a blood sample, and I can tell you if you're stressed or not, right? Psychologically, how you're dealing with stress is a very different question, but physiologically, I can tell you absolutely how you're responding to stress. What's important is that in an acute state, that is very healthy. You should respond, and that's exactly what should happen. You should crank up your glucocorticoids. Eventually, those glucocorticoids will feed back. This is a very standard feedback mechanism that these blue arrows are showing you. And all across the brain, and in the pituitary, and in the adrenal, it will work to then shut the system down. Because you don't want chronic high levels of glucocorticoids. Why? Because evolution has seen to it that we all respond to stress. That's important. Those glucocorticoids are necessary. But why would they be necessary? Imagine evolutionarily, what would you need to do in the face of stress? You would need to respond to it. You would need to promote the ability to have glucose, right? You need to have energy availability. There's certain things that turn on, certain things that turn off. At the end of the day, that is necessary. But to do that prolonged is not healthy. So both peripherally, what glucocorticoids can do, right? They interact with your immune system. They interact uh, catabolically. They promote all kinds of um, uh, protein wasting. But also importantly, they act in your brain, right? They feed back here to shut the system down. But over time, they can be extremely detrimental, right? So Bruce McEwen and others have shown that the glucocorticoids within your hippocampus, which is the region of your brain for learning and memory, can be very detrimental, can start to kill your neurons. So chronic stress, not a good thing, okay? So that's why the system being in terms of how it acts normally is very important. Dysregulated, hypo or hyper, again, not good. So I just want to quickly run through this. So the way that we do this with mice, mice are very responsive rodents. They respond to just about anything you do to them. They'll fire off their stress axis. So it's very easy to stress a mouse. This is just showing you one example of how we do in a controlled fashion. We take a 50 mil conical tube. The mice just crawl right in there. You put the lid on. You leave them there for 15 minutes. And you can take teeny tiny little samples of blood from their tail. And you can look at their stress response. OK, so what's really important here at this curve, don't pay attention to the colors. Just look at the curve itself. What I'm measuring now is this output, glucocorticoids. So in rodents, the glucocorticoid being produced is called corticosterone. In humans, it would be cortisol. Okay, so in mice, it's corticosterone. So we can measure these levels over time. What's really important and what's beautiful about being able to do this is this will tell you if something's not right across this curve, it can tell you where to look in the brain for something to be wrong. So there's the baseline, so you stick the mouse in the tube, and remember I told you how long it takes a while for these glucocorticoids to be made. So once you shove it in the tube, you can get a quick sample, and that will tell you their baseline, right? That's this zero point here on the curve. That baseline is really important because your circadian rhythm in all mammals, again, regulates your cortisol levels. So before you wake up in the morning, your cortisol levels start to rise, and that's sort of what gets the energy moving and going. And in rodents, they're nocturnal, so it's sort of at the opposite end of the spectrum. So this baseline is regulated by different parts of the brain, within the hypothalamus, but slightly different. Then you have this maximal rise. So this animal is in here only for 15 minutes. We take it out, we put it back in its cage. But about 30 minutes after we started that stress, you will see in all mammals, again, this maximal rise. That maximal rise is determined by other parts of the brain that includes sort of your limbic system that tell you how high of a response to produce. 
Now that animal's been in its cage now for another hour, hour and a half following removal from that tube and we take another sample and that's the recovery. And that tells you about this feedback. It should be shut down. A lot of times we'll see in animals that have dysregulated features of their brain that it doesn't shut down. It goes on for a long time or it shuts down too fast. So there's lots of aspects we can learn just by this one physiological example here. And the great thing about it is that it tells you a lot that is very translational to humans because again, it's the same pathway. Okay, so now that we're all on the same page about stress. So we're very interested in understanding how that stress axis could go wrong. How is it that developmentally someone's brain might be hypo or hyper responsive to stress? There's lots of ways, but how can we understand that? So one of the ways that we do this is by looking at maternal stress. So if mom is stressed while she's pregnant, and that stress chronically stressed, meaning we're not one stressor, we're going to give her a stressor every day for a period of time, that chronic stress will cause changes, all kinds of changes, not just in those glucocorticoids, remember. Those glucocorticoids will change her insulin, her glucose, her leptin, her adiposity, et cetera. So all of those features could influence the offspring. Now, because we're here to talk about epigenetics, this F0, we call it, the first generation, the mom, right? She's the one who's gestating. And again, we're using stress, but you could use diet or infection to understand this concept. So whatever's happening in mom's hormonal milieu could affect somatically this F1 generation that, that's, gen, that's gestating here, right, including brain tissue. But at the same time, her germ cells, he or she, this offspring here, germ cells are also present and they can be exposed as well. So that's really interesting because you can end up with an exposure of mom that, that affects this first generation because it's somatically, the tissues other than the germ cells are being programmed, right? So you can imagine that the brain developing, depending on when the insult happened, could affect it in X or Y different kind of fashion and could very differently affect those germ cells epigenetically. So you could have an F1 phenotype outcome that's very different than an F2. Or interestingly, and I think this will come up later when we're talking about autism, you could end up with an F1 that doesn't show a phenotype at all, and now you have an F2 that shows up with something because it was programmed from what their grandma actually did during, during pregnancy. So it's a really interesting idea to think about how this conceptualizes. Okay, so how do we look in rodents and understand anything about neuropsychiatric disease? So I just have a couple examples here. So in our studies, we stressed mom we did a comparison all across pregnancy, and we found, surprisingly, that it was stress in the first. So uh, rodent gestation is about 20 days, depending on the strain you're using. We do stress for, we've, we've divided into three parts, early, mid, and late. So it's about seven days of stress. We did a comparison. We looked at male and female offspring and all kinds of batteries of tests looking at their stress responses, behaviorally and physiologically. And we actually found, surprisingly, that it was male offspring only that showed a phenotype in our model, and it was only when moms were stressed really early in pregnancy. The brain isn't even developing yet when we were doing that stress, so I'll get to that in a minute. But what I want to show you is some of those outcomes here. So not only did the F1 males show a phenotype, but when we bred those F1 males to control females, their sons showed the phenotype as well which largely means that the germ cells are also involved. This is some of the ways that we are able to understand stress responsivity in a mouse. Why? Because if I were to ask you, if you know someone with a diagnosis of depression or schizophrenia or autism, those are based on the DSM-5 criteria. Right? You go into a psychiatric or physician's office, they do an interview, they may give you a form to fill out, they'll ask you how you're feeling, there's all sorts of criteria. There is no blood prick test, yes, you have schizophrenia. It involves a conversation. We cannot ask a mouse how they're feeling, unfortunately. They won't fill out forms for us. So what we have to do instead is we look at that physiological response. That's one thing we can look at. We look at changes in things like growth and body weight. We look at all the physiological measures. Here's that HPA response I'm going to talk about. We also do all kinds of behavioral tests. And these behavioral tests are difficult to interpret, but in large part they're basically asking, here's how a normal mouse, not from a stressed mom, behaves in this particular test. Here's how this offspring is behaving. And we can interpret that as, well, that's definitely a different behavioral response, what's going on with that animal. This is just showing you cognition. There's lots of ways, tests, we can train animals to learn a maze, learn how to escape into a particular hole. And that is something that the animals will learn over time. We can look at how they learn it, the strategies they use, et cetera, and we can look at those facets. What I'm showing you here is that in our F1 males and their F2 offspring as well, there was a, a cadre of, of stress-responsive aspects that showed that these animals were hyper-responsive to stress. This is actually showing you their body weight post-weaning. Born totally normal, eat totally normal, all the way up until we wean them. Weaning occurs at a particular stage at which they're both going through puberty, 
and it's very stressful because now you're being taken away from your mom into a cage with just your same sex litter mates. So it's both a stressful period and a pubertal period. We're not sure which drives this. But these early stressed male offspring show about a 10% drop, and they maintain that throughout. So they just they either aren't gaining quite as much weight, or maybe it's an adiposity feature, we don't know. But this is both male, uh, sorry, both F1 and F2 males show this phenotype. They also have this hyper-responsive stress response. Remember I showed you this curve? Here's a normal male responding to that stress. Here are these early stressed males. Higher levels of glucocorticoids. So every time they're stressed, they're producing more of those glucocorticoids. This is a learning and memory task. This is just showing you that the latency, the time it takes them to learn a particular task that we showed them, took those male offspring, F1 and F2, a lot longer. Okay. So when we start thinking mechanistically, how do we determine how it is, and why is it only the males and not the females? If you think about a features like autism, where it's a predominance of males over females, or schizophrenia, where males present with schizophrenia much earlier in life than, than women do, and you have much more severe negative symptoms, why is that? Why is there a difference in neurodevelopmental disease gender bias? We started thinking about, well, in, in rodents, you have in the same uterus, mom's being stressed, in that same uterus, you have male and female offspring, what is the difference? Well, one, they all have their own placenta. And everything that is being transmitted from mom's milieu, everything she's experiencing, has to interact with this tissue. This is a very endocrine tissue. Okay, so this is a very endocrine tissue. It's going to respond to everything going on during pregnancy. It's not just there as a sponge. It is there to respond to and try to help assist all of the nutrients, oxygen, glucose, et cetera, that this developing fetus is going to see everything that they need for normal development. But think about it, evolutionarily, during development, we talked about a little bit about this last night, everything that is developing, especially in your brain, everything that's developing is anticipation of what that future external environment is going to be, right? You want to be the best fit. If you're perceiving stress, what is the biggest stressor evolutionarily you can think of? Famine, right? So the energy availability. So you start stressing mom, you're going to change that energy availability, you're gonna change those signals within the placenta, and you can change the information that both the somatic tissue and the germ cells are going to think is going on. So think about that. Now, how is there sex specificity? Well, the placenta predominantly is derived out of the blastocyst. So the placenta itself, about 80, 85% of it is derived out of the blastocyst, so it's going to be XX or XY. Right? There's part of it that's the maternal decidua that's from mom, but most of it, the trophoblastic cells are all out of the blastocyst. So you will have a female placenta with a female fetus and a male placenta with a male fetus. So if you have sex differences in how this tissue is responding, you can end up with sex differences long term. This just shows you, shows you a schematic of the overall aspect of what we're studying here. This is showing you we're doing maternal stress in our model very early. It's the first seven days of gestation. There's no brain development really that's going on, but what in large part is going on is massive placental development. So if perturbations are happening early that could shape how that placenta is going to develop, it could, it could change everything throughout the rest of the remainder of pregnancy in terms of what this developing fetus will think is going on for the environment. So we did a very simple but elegant study. I had a postdoc, Chris Howerton, who wanted to know, well, what are the sex differences in this placental tissue? If, first of all, if you just remove stress from the picture and just ask, over the course of rodent gestation, what are the sex differences in the placenta? Well, let's start with what are the differences in the placenta? This Venn diagram with these really large numbers is from microarray analysis, which means we're just looking across all patterns of gene expression in the placenta and comparing mid to mid-late to late gestation, so 12 to 15 to 18 points in gestation. And you can see there's, what this Venn diagram is showing you the differences, meaning there's tons of stuff changing all across gestation in the placenta. The placenta doesn't just develop and then it remains stagnant. It's very dynamic is what this is showing you. Okay, then if you specifically ask, of all the changes going on with the placenta across pregnancy, if you sort by sex, how many of them are sex specific? And as you can see, really very few. Now remember, these are rodents, so they are inbred uh, mouse strains which are sort of genetically identical. So that way we can, we can control all of the environmental factors in this, in this study, right? So in humans it would be largely different. But not a lot is, is different. And that means, and if you actually ask yourself, well, what would be different, right? There's no gonad, there's not gonad of hormones that are influencing the placenta, so what is it? It's XX or XY, meaning so the, the genes that are different, as I'm showing you here, are either expressed on the X chromosome or on the Y chromosome. Okay, so if they're on the X and they're higher in females, what does that mean? 
that means they're escaping X inactivation. And you can see all of these genes, for those who are in the know, are really important for everything about chromatin remodeling. Which, what does that mean? That means if a female placenta, which is able to mount responses different than a male placenta, maybe that's this buffering capacity that we see again and again in the lab with females. And this is true also in the human world. It's so much the case that prenatal perturbations, for some reason, females are able to mount responses to buffer from those perturbations that males just aren't. And so any neonatologist will tell you when something happens neonatally and the baby is in the neon, uh, intensive care unit, females go home before males. For whatever reason, females just seem to, from prenatal perturbations, rebound faster and buffer better than the males do. Postnatal insults seem to more specifically affect females. So we don't really understand why that is. Okay, so the one gene I want to talk about today quickly is this gene called OGT or O-glycosyl transferase. You don't need to know a lot about it except for that it's an enzyme. It's X-linked gene. It escapes X inactivation only in the placenta. Thus far, no one's found it to escape X inactivation anywhere else. So in the placenta, female placentas have twice as much of it expressed as males do. So in this OGT turns out to be a fascinating enzyme because it is known to be so important for so many different things. But it acts in so many ways to modify chromatin structures. It affects transcription. So you can imagine if there's twice as much of it in a female placenta, I like to think of it as it acts as a, a canary in the gestational coal mine, meaning it's constantly sampling the environment and it's a protective feature because it can call into play and change many different things that are important. Okay, so what did we do? So this is one of the ways that we do in the lab that we can ask a question about a biochemical readout. This enzyme places a protein mark, a mark on proteins called oglycanacylation. It's, it's basically a sugar mark. There is antibodies that recognize this. So we can ask, is there a difference in the readout in male and female placentas? And I just wanted to show you this. Every other lane here is protein from a male or a female placenta, right? So this is female, male, female, male. This is marker, don't pay attention to that. So every other lane, you can clearly see if you load all of the protein from a female placenta versus all of the protein from a male placenta, there's way more of this O-glycosylated protein in the female placenta than the male. That's great because that tells us this gene that we identified functionally fits with what we're seeing for its, its gene expression. That's important. Ideally, if you're going to study something in a rodent, as I said earlier, you want it to be meaningful translationally for a human. So we were able to get de-identified placental tissue very easy from the hospital at Penn and ask, we don't know anything about the pregnancy other than the fact that it was a C-section delivery, so it's likely that there may have been some issue. So we only look within each placenta. So we can ask the question, is this gene expressed in the human placenta? And is it expressed X dosage dependent? Meaning, in every placenta, remember I told you that there's the maternal decidua on one side of the placenta, which will be on this side here, which is always mom, XX. And on a, in a, a male baby, you would have XY, and in a female baby, you would have XX. So one, is it expressed in the human placenta? Because if it's not, then we're following up on something that's not really translational. And two, is it expressed in an X dosage effect? And the answer is yes. Here you have the XY side versus the XX side, and it didn't matter if it was a female or male placenta. The XX dosage held true, so it's twice as much in a female placenta on the side of female than in a male and here's again that oglycosylation total protein showing you the same thing, that in XYs, there's less oglycosylated protein than the XX side. So that's great. But what we really care about as neuroscientists is, so we've identified this gene. What I didn't tell you is that in our model of prenatal stress, so it starts off higher, it escapes X inactivation in the female placenta. Remember, again, in the uterus of a mouse, we have a litter. So we can do comparisons within that uterus. So in a female placenta, it's twice as high as a male. Now we add stress, what happens? It goes way down. But now the females are at the level of a control male and the males are almost undetectable. Here we're talking about that buffering capacity. Because females started so much higher, they can afford to lose a lot of the action of this enzyme, whereas males maybe have now dropped below a point where the function becomes critically important. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask the question, well, so what? What does this have to do with the developing brain? Because as I told you, my funding comes from the National Institute of Mental Health, and they don't care about what's going on in the placenta. They care what's going on in the brain. So how do we go from, this is just showing you um, fetuses here in these tiny little placentas. This is just showing you two from the inside of the uterus. How do we go from this placenta when we're stressing mom to the developing mouse brain? 
How does that information from one gene that we're studying that we've identified make a difference? Well, this is where transgenic mice come into play. And for many people who probably wonder why do we spend so much time in the world of science working on mice, one of the reasons that mice have become so incredibly popular is because of transgenics. And transgenics allows us to ask these very specific genetic questions. We've identified this gene. This gene has really important, in fact, this gene is very important for epigenetics itself, right? OGT is really important for chromatin modifications. Okay, so how does this one gene play into, in the placenta only, play into brain development? Well, we can specifically ask by using transgenics, and I'm not going to go into the explanation of all this, but we can cross basically two lines of mice that allow us to specifically target this one gene only in those trophoblastic placental cells, only, nowhere else. So now we can skip the stress and just genetically alter this gene, lower it, and ask, does it have the same effect on the brain? So this is what we do. We cross a, a, a mouse that allows us to express a particular enzyme of interest called Cree recombinase only in trophoblastic cells of the placenta. This is just showing the evidence here. And we cross this with a mouse that has transgenics, these special sites around this OGT gene. When we cross the two, only in the trophoblastic cells of the placenta, this is just showing you there's no expression in the developing fetus, only in those trophoblastic cells, not in the maternal decidua, do you get turn on of this enzyme, and it will knock out this gene only in those cells. Okay, and the beautiful thing is that it turns on right at the end of when we, been, when we do stress, so that's perfect timing for asking this question about the brain. So no stress, just targeting this one gene, what happens to those offspring when the gene has been disrupted in the placenta? Now remember, we're trying to do, so this is showing you the expression pattern within the placenta, this is fluorescence, showing you the expression here. That we're trying to recapitulate aspects of their body weight phenotype and their stress responsivity. So if we target this gene, now remember, it's X-linked. So in a female placenta, we can get wild type, meaning it didn't knock out. We can get hemizygous, because we can knock it out just on one chromosome. So one will express and one won't. So we have full expression, half expression, and knockout. In a male placenta, we have just two options, turned on or turned off, right? Knocked in, knocked out, okay? So lo and behold, if we first look over here, so this is showing you the HPA response. It's not as robust of a change, which probably means obviously there are other factors involved besides this one gene. But these are the male offspring. This is wild type, normal expression, their HPA response. This is when we knock out just the OGT in the trophoblastic cells by embryonic day 12.5. Okay, so it's hyper responsive. Again, it's not as high as we saw before, but it's significantly higher in their glucocorticoid production. But what's also really amazing, born totally normal up until weaning, body weight growth totally normal. Post weaning, again, we see this drop. So what I'm showing you here are the males. These are the female offspring. This is wild type. And these are from the same, within the same litter, right? Because the way you cross animals, genetically, you can get all of the different genotypes in the same litter. This is the wild type. This is the knockout for OGT in the placenta male. These are the females. Here you see that degradation, full expression, Half expression, no expression, only in the placenta. Don't pay attention. The coat colors are strain. We used mixed strain in my lab, so all the coat colors do not determine, I mean, they're not important here. So this is showing you dose dependency of this one gene in the placenta that we know is affected by stress. So that's pretty impressive that I can recapitulate that aspect. Okay, so that's all about, I'm going to talk about mom. What I now want to talk about quickly is dad. Right, so this is actually you know, the last time my son posed smiling for, uh, he's now 15 and you would never catch him smiling in a photograph. <laughs> so everybody wants to blame mom. We've talked a lot about mom. It makes sense that mom gestating, everything that she does could, could impact. And again, I want to point out, we only talked about stress. It could be also positive aspects. Right? We don't know. When I'm showing you this curve right here, I want to point out too much glucocorticoids over a long period of time absolutely is not good. But this is just an acute stress response. I can't tell you if this is healthy or not healthy. We don't know. We're just showing you that it's different, okay? I'm not trying to say that this is all bad. We don't know in a lot of features, especially in rodents, if the differences necessarily are disease risk or disease resilience. I'm just showing you that the perturbations we're looking at changed the brain, and that's what's important here. So in thinking about mom, that seems straightforward, but what about dad? What contribution does dad make in terms of his germ, shell, germ cells and his lifetime experiences and exposures? That's very important to think about. And can we blame dad too, or can we also reward dad? I mean, maybe if dad's led a very healthy lifestyle, his contributions will be great. Okay, so why is this such a complex model? In mom, when we're talking about contributions, whether it be programming or epigenetics, 
We have many things to think about, right? But with dad, especially in the rodent world, there's only one. There's only one thing that dad passes on in the rodent world because dad does not participate in rearing of his offspring. So if dad is able to pass on a trait to his offspring because we put them together to breed one night, we check for a copulation plug in the morning, dad comes back out of that cage. All right, so I can't promise you that he's not whispering all kinds of things to mom during that night. But what I can promise you is that he is not around throughout pregnancy and he is not around to interact with his offspring. So if we do some exposure to dad and his offspring show a difference, well then that, that mark, that epigenetic mark that we're interested in that I talked about in the beginning has to be here. And that's what we're interested in. This is very difficult to sort out in mom. Right? As I told you, just talking about the placenta, there's so many features here that we don't understand yet in, in mom. Okay, so just to speed things along, the studies came a lot out of the Swedish famine literature. Right? So the Swedish famine was a period of time in which uh, the Overcalix region of northern Sweden, in which they kept extremely good health records. Right? They kept these in the basement of their churches, the gestational lengths, birth weights, all of this information, growth charts. There was a period of time where there was either famine, meaning that the harvest was horrible, and it's so isolated, it wasn't like you could just run to the store and pick up groceries, right? So everybody had really reduced caloric intake. And there also was periods of time where there was overabundance, and because they didn't have ways to preserve uh, and store the food, they, had, they ate it, right? So they kept track of those years of harvest under and overabundance, and then they looked at the offspring. And from a lot of this, uh, this information has come out of it that there was a period of time in which boys, and this was prior to puberty, so if there was a famine prior to puberty, prior to that rapid growth of puberty, that their germ cells were actually vulnerable and their offspring and grand offspring showed differences in longevity and health and cardiovascular disease. And those were actually countered if that same period of time there was overabundance of calories. Okay. So that's just sort of a, a, a clip from all of that data because there's tons of data out there now. So we started thinking about those studies and thinking, okay, what about dad's lifetime experiences? What about stress? Could we, could we stress the male mouse and then breed him? And would he pass on the effects to his offspring? And was there a particular window in which those, those germ cells would be vulnerable? And thinking about the course of spermatogenesis, so I just need to quickly touch on the fact that what we thought we knew about uh, how germ cells could be reprogrammed. So there's about a six week period of time in which most mammals, mice, mice especially, that the spermatogenesis occurs. Why is that important? Because when you get to the point of having mature, almost mature sperm that are sitting in the epididymis, everything is, of dad's DNA is so compact now, right? Because most of the histones have been swapped out for protamines, right? They're wound up really, really tight. There's really no way for the environment to get in there and reorder or re reprogram uh, epigenetic marks. So you think about the DNA methylation I talked about. There's so few histones that are there. So how would the environment pass on a trait? And we'll, we'll come back to that because we were wrong when we started thinking about this. But that's what we thought. So we thought, okay, well, let's do a test. Let's stress the male. Let's include that prepubertal and pubertal window. Let's do six weeks of stress. And let's compare that to a male we're stressing as a full adult to a male that's not stressed at all. So there's three groups. And we started those studies in the lab with six weeks of stress. We have since followed it up now with four weeks, so we can get the same effect with four weeks of stress. In fact, we have followed it up with one week of stress, and so I'll get to that in a second. We give them a week off after stress, and that's because when we put them with the mom, we don't want them being all stressed out and stressing out mom, because that would be a confound. We then breed with control females. Again, check copulation plug, take the male out so he's not in there during pregnancy. We've also done the study where we've given three months, so we've bred them one week and then left, maybe we can rebreed the males, three months later and bred them again. And then we examined their male and female offspring for phenotypes. Okay, so this was a study that a grad student proposed and I said, let's do it, but it's gonna be preposterous. Don't tell your thesis committee because there's no way this is gonna work. Because the dogma was germ cells were set once they've gone through this development, early developmental window, which I won't get into, there's no way they're gonna be reprogrammed by mild stress. I was wrong. So what I'm showing you here are the male offspring and female offspring of these males. The white here is the control. The top bar here is the control from the control non-stressed dads. Dads that were stressed that included pubertal window or dads that were stressed simply as adults in both cases for their offspring were hypo-responsive to stress. Not hyper like the mom's phenotype. Hypo. So they're less responsive to stress. 
Well, that might make sense, right? If you're going to be, if you're going to want to pass on a trait to your offspring, it's going to be a stressful environment. Maybe the best thing is to be less responsive. It's really exciting because these offspring never met their dad. They know nothing about their dad, and yet they have this feature. And I don't have time to go into it, but we took these animals through a huge cadre of every behavioral test we do in the rodent world. And that's higher order, because remember I showed you that hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is grand central station. It needs to be moderating everything. It determines everything that the, the higher order part of the brain knows about, and it determines everything the feedback from the periphery. So it makes sense the hypothalamus that's dictating this aspect got rewired, but the higher order structures weren't affected. Their behavior's not different. Every test we put them through, totally normal. It was really just how they physiologically responded to stress. How then, which is the exciting piece of this now, because now we have the sperm from these dads, what mark should we look for? This is very exciting, never really been thought about before. So thinking about this, we can look at DNA methylation, because there are certainly methylation marks that are going to be found in the sperm. There are a few histones that are retained. Could we look at those? Complex in both cases. There are so, there's only about 3% of histones that are retained in rodents. If you're going to start looking for differences in acetylation or methylation of those, it's very, very complicated to do methodologically. So we skip that for now. Methylation we could do. We're still thinking about it. And that's interesting. The problem is we don't have any way to then say, I see a change. What does that change mean? I can't go in and change a methylation mark and ask if I get the same outcome. But what I can do are these small non-coding RNAs. So what are small non-coding RNAs? Small non-coding RNAs are really cool. These are microRNAs. These are genes themselves. Sometimes they're their own genes. Sometimes they're inserted in another gene. They're regulated, really interesting, very dynamically by the environment. They are made in these little short hairpin loops. They are processed within the nucleus. Then they're kind of spit out. They're further processed. And they're loaded into this protein complex in the cytoplasm called a risk complex. This complex contains one particular subunit called Argonaut 2. This protein chews up mRNA. So what do microRNAs do? Well, they, they're loaded into this protein co this complex, and then they're partnered with a target mRNA. So a microRNA can target up to over 100 mRNAs. So now you don't need to be changing DNA sequence or transcription because you have these microRNAs that can chew up your mRNAs. They never get made into proteins. It is a fast, really dynamic way for the environment to determine everything that's going to be translated or not end up translated. And that is how they function. And they're very, very interesting, and they're abundant in sperm. So we sorted all of our sperm. Now, we were modeling this, looking for microRNAs in the dad's sperm in both those that have been stressed puberty and adult that were significantly and robustly different than the control dads. And we came up with nine. This one we're not talking about. It's, it's, it was decreased. But this one, these nine microRNAs were significantly and robustly increased in all of the dads who gave rise to the offspring that had the hypo-responsive HP axis. OK, so why is that interesting? This is what I love about microRNAs. I can now say, that's interesting, but how do you know that they had anything to do with that brain? Because now we can take a zygote, which is a fertilized egg, right? We can isolate the zygotes. We can take our nine microRNAs, we can have them synthesized, and we inject them into these, these zygotes. So no stress involved. We're just taking normal, normal fertilized eggs, injecting them with the microRNAs like what would happen at fertilization, and asking the question, do these offspring show the same behavioral, the same, sorry, the same stress response difference that we saw? And the answer is amazingly yes. So what I'm showing you here in red, these are the male offspring, these are the female offspring. The red line is showing you that same exact hypo-responsive HPA axis. The PBS is your control injection. And then to control for the fact that you're injecting all of these microRNAs into that zygote, you have to control for that because remember I told you that risk complex? That is, Richard Schultz has shown at Penn that that complex is essential for normal development. So what if you overload it and now you're just getting a phenotype from that? So we picked randomly, and I mean literally randomly, we just picked one of these microRNAs and we injected it at the same concentration to control for that extra amount. All right, we don't see that, that process there. So it's only when all nine were injected that we see the exact same response, which is truly amazing, a hypo-responsive HP axis. Now, I know that Ali's going to jump on this as well and talk a little bit about what in the world could be happening. And this, this is a question that's really important to think about. This is showing you the difference between an oocyte cytoplasm and a sperm cytoplasm. So if I'm going to tell you and try and convince you that these teeny tiny amount of microRNAs in this cytoplasm are able to enter into this giant 
oocyte cytoplasm and have an effect. That's pretty amazing. But that's the fact we're telling you. So what is it, what is it in fact that those microRNAs can do that I could actually convince you are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing? Well, I just told you, what do microRNAs do? They degrade mRNAs. Well, what mRNAs are present at fertilization? Only mom's mRNAs. They're called stored maternal mRNAs, and all mammals have them. And this is just showing you on the y-axis here, RNAs that are present at fertilization all the way through development. And there's, it's all moms, it's all maternal stored mRNAs, and then by the blastula stage, they're all degraded, and then you get transcription, you start to get uh, the transcription from post-fertilization that occurs. So everything initially that derives the normal, the first part of development is all about mom. So what if dad wants to have a say? What if dad wants to determine how early development goes? Well, these microRNAs might be a way in which you could do that, because the microRNAs can go in and target mom's stored maternal mRNAs. So that was our hypothesis, and the way in which we do that is we can actually re-inject our nine microRNAs into these zygotes. We can culture them for about 24 hours until they're not quite at the two-cell stage. So we're basically taking a single cell. The oocyte, the fertilized zygote, is the largest cell in your body, right? In fact, you can actually, you can actually see it when we inject these mice, like in the tube. You look on a little microscope, you can see the single cell. So you do this, this fluidime amplification. I'm not going to go into how we do this, but basically you're asking the question, if we target this against moms, so I took that slide out. So we, we ask the question, we know Richard Schultz has published what all of the stored maternal mRNAs at this stage in the mouse oocyte are. We can use three different databases online, which will tell you the predictive of our nine mirrors. What are their, what are their predicted mRNA targets? We cross-reference those two, and we came up a list of 92 important mRNAs that we load on this fluidime card. And you're basically taking a single zygote cell, and you're loading it in here, and you're amplifying all of the mRNA, one cell. You're amplifying it all and asking in the, in the oocytes, the zygotes that we injected, did the microRNAs go in and target the mRNAs? That's what we're asking there. And the answer is, in fact, they did. This is just showing you compared to PBS injection, the single mirror that didn't produce the phenotype, and then the nine mirrors. And what this black is showing you is that the predominant thing that those nine mirrors did overall for all of the genes we selected, this is, this is log two-fold change, so it's a huge change, is that it did what we expected. And believe it or not, this is the first time anybody has ever shown this. MicroRNAs went in in that giant cytoplasm and degraded a bunch of the stored maternal mRNA. So it did what we thought it did, which is, I think, amazing. So here's just some of the, the candidates for those interested. The ones that we're really excited about included CERT1 and UB3A because these have both been linked with neurodevelopmental disorders. So that was really interesting. And this is just showing you some of the data from the brain. I'm not going to belabor this. But we're looking, thinking again about the offspring and their phenotype. Right? So the, the offspring I showed you had the hypo-responsive HPA. So we can go into the brain. That's another beautiful thing about working on rodents, is that I can go into the brain, that PVN, that paraventricular nucleus that's responsible for how they're responding to stress, we can micro-punch that teeny, teeny, tiny part of the brain. And we can do an RNA-seq analysis and ask, the animals that had only PBS injection versus the animals that had the, the multi, the nine microRNA injections. And you can see, I think, clearly on this heat map here that they predominantly sort, meaning the gene expression pattern in this teeny tiny part of the brain that directs stress is very much different between the animals, the control animals, and those with the hypo. And this is just shown better here, showing you the principal components sorting. And what's really interesting is that if you look at this, I think you can clearly see, this is, again, log two-fold change. What this is showing you is we take all these genes and ask, how did they sort based on expression, up or down? The predominant feature is that they're repressed. And we see this both with when we stress the dads and bred them, their offspring, if we compare that data, versus if we compare the data where we injected. It's the exact same thing. So it's doing the same thing at the stage of the zygote, and then there's a million different steps, and then there's the brain. And it's doing the same thing in terms of it's repre there's a repressive mark somewhere here that's changing how these, these genes are being expressed. And I'm not going to go into this except for this amazing thing when you actually look at, well, what genes? What has changed? What's really cool is that it, there's 17 collagen genes. And I'm a neuroscientist. I don't know about you, but I was like, what are all these collagens doing? Well, collagens are really important for understanding, thinking about the blood-brain barrier. And remember I told you the hypothalamus is the part of the brain's grand central station. It needs to receive signals from the periphery. It needs to regulate this negative feedback, right? So that's a large part determined by the blood-brain barrier. This is showing you that PVN, 
Can you make out this triangle here? So this, is, this would be a ventricle in the brain. This is mouse brain. This is the vascularization of the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. What I'm showing you this is because it's the most vascularized, as you would expect, part of the brain. It needs to be in constant surveillance of the periphery. What do collagens do in these connective tissues? Well, they determine a lot about how the, the information from the periphery, whether or not it makes it into the brain. So maybe, maybe this is a way evolutionarily that these dynamic changes in the environment can ultimately end up and changing how we respond and change to our environment. And so I'm just going to end with this very giant schematic for those uh, interested in thinking about the evolutionary perspective here, which is here's your hypothalamus, as I told you, Grand Central Station. It's regulating in, from the peripheral feedback and behavioral feedback within the brain so many aspects that are important evolutionarily. How we eat, how we sleep, how we reproduce, how we respond to stress, how we grow. It is all how we enter puberty is all determined from these neurons within the hypothalamus, how they interact with the pituitary. So gosh, you know, it's surprising that dad's stress could reprogram this part of the brain, but maybe it's not. And it's not a disease. I'm not showing you that these animals are, are hugely sick and are, are in trouble of dying. What I'm showing you is that they have changed how they respond to the environment. And maybe that makes them better fit for the stressful environment that they think they're being born into. Okay, so why then does your brain respond to stress the way it does? Do you consider yourself to be a type A or type B? Are you hyper or hypo? Well, it's clear that what we thought was very simple is really not. In fact, whether or not it's dad's germ cells, mom's germ cells, or gestation, right? There's so many points at which the environment can influence how your brain ultimately develops. And anticipation of a given environment is very complicated. And it's no doubt the reason that we don't fully understand things like schizophrenia or autism or depression. It's very, very complicated. And so we definitely, you know, whether or not you can blame your parents, I think your parents, grandparents, et cetera, certainly contribute to it, but it's also based upon what the anticipation was. I think you can blame evolution maybe on the fact that the best fit aspect of your environment is a key feature here. So without that, I want to thank you for your attention this morning. Hopefully everybody stayed awake. There'll be a test later. The critical members of my lab, which I don't have an updated picture, so Eldon is a postdoc in my lab who actually trained here, received his PhD here, uh, is a phenomenal new postdoc in the lab. Uh, he's working on the microbiome, which is a whole separate topic, right? So mom's vaginal microbiome um, and how that affects the developing brain is really interesting. I want to thank all of uh, our support from the National Institute of Mental Health which is critical for the research that we do, and all of our great collaborators at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm happy to take questions. So I think we'll take questions for about five minutes before our break. Mike. Um, I wasn't sure when you stressed the mothers. Was it in the first, in early pregnancy? When we, oh, days one through seven. So at days one through seven or days one through 12, there are enormous s sexual dimorphism in the placenta. And essentially, placental development is finished by about day 12. 12.5, yeah. Um, so you're seeing um, differences late which uh, relate to the X chromosome. But at the time that the stress occurs, uh, sexual dimorphism is evident in the development of the placenta. So what do you mean by sexual dimorphism? Well, uh, gene expression is different between the sexes. Okay. And then the other thing is you... Not dramatically so. So as I showed you, we only found seven genes that are really different across all of pregnancy. what days did you compare? Pardon me? What days did you compare? So we did... So, so the 12, 15, and 18... So the, the placenta's already mature by that yeah. stage. Um, the other thing is that dogma has it, and dogma may be wrong, that, that the dad's turned paternal off. X chromosome is inactivated yep. in the mouth. Yep. No, so that's, that's another thing that we talked about last night, which is that so much of what this studies have shown goes in large part against a lot of dogma. Right? So the dogma that the extra embryonic tissue, the entire paternal genome is, is turned off. We clearly, and others in this room, have clearly seen that that's not the case. We see lots of genes expressed from the Y chromosome. So that's not the case that it's turned off. No, I'm not saying yeah. Silent. Yeah, yeah. I'm really saying is that dogma has it. Yeah, well. But if it's at least partially inactivated, would it give more? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. 
So it may be that there are certain genes that are, that are escaping that aspect that we're seeing, and OGT happens, like I said, there's not a lot of them that we're seeing. There was very few. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Really neat to look at the microRNA from the sperm because there's so few options to look for into what can be carried through, and, and it, it does uh, affect the, the, the zygote as well. But have you looked? Uh, have you looked at the overlap between uh, the microRNA in the oocyte uh, with what occurs in the sperm as a result of, of stress? So look at the. The, the, the microRNA, well, we, we, you saw the changes in the microRNA due to stress in, uh, in the sperm and, and those that affect behavior uh, in the oocyte, uh, are there similar micro, what, what sort of microRNA changes occur in the oocyte? Is it a similar mechanism, uh, perhaps? And we, we assume that with uh, the female, there are many different possible ways that it So we have that so, that, so you're asking, so if you stressed a female before she was pregnant, right. would you, you induce you see the, the same, same microRNA? It, yeah, so we haven't done that because collecting uh, mature oocytes is much more complicated than collecting mature sperm, obviously, for, for good reason. So we haven't, we haven't done that. There are individuals who are looking at female exposures prior to pregnancy. Uh, none that I've seen that have actually collected oocytes and asked any kind of epigenetic question. Certainly people have done things like expose uh, the female to certain dietary changes or infection, et cetera, and then gotten her pregnant. But in those studies, you can't say that that's oocyte derived. I mean, it still could be effects on the uterus, right. her behavior, her, you know, system. It's the question about the microRNA. Right. No, so uh, you certainly could do it if you were willing to go in and, and reproductively collect the, the oocytes that were, yeah. I mean, you could absolutely do that. We haven't, but it's a good question, yeah. Tracy, over here. So as you know, we've published as well on sexually dimorphic effects in the placenta. And... You know, I think, I mean, following up on Mike Roberts' question, that there may be effects, you know, on the sex chromosomes. But also, we have to keep in mind there are some differences between mouse and human. You know, I think... Of course, yeah. Well, I mean, there is clear evidence that the paternal one is selectively um, inactivated, for the most part, in the mouse. That is not so clear, though, in the human. If you believe, like Jenny Graves, other ones have argued that it's a random event in humans. And I'll let you comment further on that. But... I would also argue it's probably more likely up few mutations, not just in the sex chromosomes. And I think the best evidence for that just recently came out that not just maternal, going back to paternal, pater changes the paternal diet. I don't know if you've come across this article, but if you change the paternal diet, you can actually change the gene expression in the placenta in a sexually dimorphic manner and correspondingly the DNA methylation changes. So that just article just came out this yeah. past month. I mean, it doesn't surprise me that. I mean, if you're going to change that the placenta is derived out of the blastocyst and you're seeing effects, so why would, you know, if dad's going to affect maternal stored mRNAs, just that, as one example, why wouldn't it affect the placenta? That doesn't well, surprise I, me. I think it, that's what I'm saying, though. I think that while the sex chromosomes may be involved in terms of sexual dimorphic differences, I still would argue epimutations, mutations, and I think Claudine Janine's work as well backs that up, too. So I'll let you comment on that. Yeah, I, I, you know, again... A, we could you know talk all day about all all the things. So the, and looking at one particular gene that we've targeted was really not saying that this is about everything. It's not, and I'm not saying that everything is also about sex chromosomes. It's not. It's one example of reasons why there might be gender bias in presentation of a given prenatal versus uh, postnatal exposure, and that it could involve the sex chromosomes and X inactivation or Y chromosome expression. It's just one example. So I, uh, you didn't talk about MIR-29A. That was one of the one that was down regulated, right? So that one uh, regulates the DNMT. So that's an interesting question. So one of the top candidates, so I told you that we looked at maternal stored mRNAs, and we cross-referenced that list with from, the, from three different databases of the top targets of our nine mirrors, the, the top gene that is affected by the most mirrors actually is DNA, it's DNA methyltransferase. So, but we didn't, that didn't come up in our, it was listed, it was one of our genes that we had in our um, fluidime array. It didn't come up, it didn't look changed, but we didn't inject the one that was reduced because that's a very different, manipulation. So we can inject the mirrors to increase their expression, but you have to use a different manipulation, use uh, mirror sponges to reduce 
And we haven't, we haven't targeted that yet. So that's why I haven't talked about that mirror, because we haven't reduced the expression. So we have one more question from Joya. Great talk, Tracy. Um, I was interested in the translational aspects of your mRNA, uh, of your microRNA studies. So you had SIRT1 uh, changed in the experiment where you're looking at paternal mirrors. Mirrors themselves are difficult to regulate, but SIRT1 can be regulated by caloric restriction. So are you thinking about how paternal feeding uh, or diet habits. Well, I think Ollie will touch a lot on the, the paternal dietary aspect. Um, we've thought uh, about ways of, of showing whether or not, so here's, here's the complexity, is that a lot of people want to jump from, and we've had reviewers for some of this um, who've made somewhat ridiculous sort of um, suggestions, which is, so if we're injecting a microRNA into a zygote, how long do you anticipate those mirrors, those microRNAs, through cell divisions to be stable? I mean, we don't know. We haven't labeled them and followed them, but my bet is going to be that they're quickly degraded, that they're probably not around past a couple cell divisions. We've had reviewers suggest that we should look for the change in these same mirrors in the brain. I think it's ludicrous. So again, and also for the, for, I mean, it's a really good point. So the, the targeting, if you inject a mirror, and as I said, it lines up with an mRNA, so it's going to affect transcription, right, stored maternal mRNAs. But if you remember that, that graph that I showed you, you have the stored maternal mRNAs, which are the only RNAs that are present. And then right around the blastula stage, they're all degraded, right? So the Richard Schultz have shown that the risk complex, the degradation, mom has tons of mirrors too, that there's an initial huge degradation of all of those stored maternal mRNAs and then a big onset of transcription that occurs as part of the developmental process. So what I'm showing you is really just, just the very beginning. It's just asking, the, it's a very stepwise question. The mirrors from dad can target the stored maternal mRNAs. 24 hours later, there's like a whole different thing going on. But if you've affected those stored maternal mRNAs, what those do, well, CERT1, UBE3A, right, they, as, as proteins, right, there's, there's still translation that's going on. If you change the protein levels at this stage, you can affect other epigenetic marks and processes. So at the single two-cell stage, you've affected these mRNAs, which will change the levels of proteins, which will change other functions at the four-cell stage, which will change other functions at the eight-cell Blah, 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 blah. The problem is it's very difficult to ask at a four-cell embryo, do you see a difference in ubiquitination or a histone, uh, for instance, a histone mark looking at, at CERT1. So that part we haven't been able to ask. What, so you did this, then what next? So I also have a question about your experimental model for stress where you're putting the mouse into a tube and that's your stressor. We know that in humans, stress behaviors are linked to diet, they're linked to exercise, to kind of mental condition. So do you know whether that mouse, after it's been stuck in a tube, eats more or less? Uh, yeah, or so these, these are more active or Right, less? so these are great questions. So an, the reason we use the restraint tube, this is standard in the field, is that you just need, to, you want to give a consistent, similar stress so that you can get, it's very, it's, a, it's an acute stress. So it's very similar to having, uh, if I ask one of you to suddenly come up here and give me a, um, do a talk quickly for the, you know, that's, a, that's an, an acute stressor, but it's not going to affect you long term. So that's why we show that the animals respond and then their, their corticosterone levels come back down. It's, it's an acute stressor. So if you do a bigger stressor, so cage change, mice, mice respond to everything. Cage change is a huge stressor to a mouse. It's like you having to move. They have to go around and remark everything, whatever else. And you will, if you follow their caloric and, and water intake, the biggest insult to, to a mouse will be cage change. You'll see it. You'll, right, so they, they every more week. More or less? Yeah. Do they eat more when they, when they have that stress? Yeah. Is, do they eat more? So, so that stressor itself is, I mean, a restraint stress is very acute, right? They're just in the tube. They're, they, they normalize by that. You know, so there's no long-term or even short-term real physiological consequences, which is why we use it. If you do something more to drive, so a lot of the behavioral tests that we do, yeah, you'll see more long-term effects. And the chronic stress that we do, which is where we do a stressor that we're using in this model, a different stressor every day at a different time of day. So I didn't go into those, but those include things like we put marbles in the cage overnight. That's a huge stressor to mice because what are these things doing in my cage? I need to bury them. So they'll respond to that. We change their cages multiple times one day. We expose them to a predator odor, 
So that's a huge stressor to them. So it's doing something every day at a different time of day that, that basically generates this chronic stress. But just the acute stress itself is very little.